One of the slowly dawning realizations I've had reading the Bible is about the celebration of powerful women in the book of Judges. There are some famous women, Delilah, Deborah, Jael, they all immediately come to mind. But there are also not so famous women whose stories really are worth reading and retelling. And one of those women is Jephthah's daughter. Hers is a fascinating story and well worth the read in Book of Judges, chapter 11. So we'll learn about her family background and the events leading up to her father's vow and what that would ultimately mean for the course of her life. So right at the beginning, we find out that Jephthah was a Gileadite. And that brings us into the region of Gilead, which had tribal associations with Reuben or Gad. We took their land and gave it as an inheritance to the Reubenites, the Gadites, and also the half-tribe of Manasseh. And probably Jephthah was living in an area Manasseh's tribe had settled, judging from further down in his story. When the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah, he passed through, here it is, Gilead and Manasseh. And we learn next that technically, Jephthah had begun his existence as an orphan. Now Jephthah the Gileadite, the son of a prostitute, was a mighty warrior. Gilead was the father of Jephthah. Now, we think of orphans as children who don't have a father or a mother. But in ancient Israel and in ancient Near East, if you were born but rejected by your father, that made you an orphan. Gilead may have been the family name, because they came from the region of Gilead, and he may have been nicknamed Gilead, or he may actually have been named Gilead, and then they named that region after him. We don't know. But Jephthah's designation as the son of a prostitute, rather than of his father's name, indicates his father must not have recognized him as a legitimate son, and therefore had not granted him covenantal rights to his name or inheritance, because the story begins with Jephthah's rejection as an heir. For Gilead's wife also bore him sons, and when his wife's sons grew up, they drove Jephthah away, saying to him, You shall not inherit anything in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. The original audience of this story knew that though the father of the household in Bronze Age Israel had the authority to appoint his own heir, the mother often exercised power in guiding that decision. And so it was that Jephthah's mother, a woman of very low status as a prostitute, was no match for his father Gilead's legal wife, who was the matriarch of Gilead's household and the mother of Gilead's other and specifically legitimate sons. When Gilead died, Jephthah's brothers had the leverage of their mother's status, making them legitimate sons, and they were able to expel Jephthah from the household and from any inheritance, and their action was reinforced by the elders of the village, as it was their responsibility to secure rights to land and children. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. Having now become a liminal person, which means there was no place for him in his household and no role for him in his village, he was now a man with no name and no property and no inheritance. The only life left to Jephthah was banditry, which actually was a career he evidently threw himself into with great success. Outlaws collected around Jephthah and went raiding with him. Jephthah's retinue of ruffians went raiding most likely along trade routes bordering Ammon and Gilead. Because we'll see from the story itself that Ammon became angry with Israel. Jephthah created quite a reputation for himself as a mighty, if marauding, warrior. So most likely, Jephthah was at least part of the reason why the Ammonites decided to make war against Israel. A rejected brother who is cast out. Does that remind you of Joseph? On the lamb, he gathers together loyal mercenaries who are constantly skirmishing with bordering people groups. Remind you of David? And he becomes a mighty warrior again. Remindful of David. Now what happens next is a true rags to riches tale. From liminal to lauded, the illegitimate son of a prostitute becomes the chief of all Gilead and one of Israel's famed judges. But he made several bargains to get there. Here's the first one. He bargains with the elders for chief of Gilead. It wasn't until threat of war that the village elders recanted their former position. We know that from a subtle shift in the story. Jephthah's reputation had become so widespread, the delegation of elders who now came to him represented all Gilead, not just Jephthah's own village. 
And since the elders were the landholding fathers in each village, presumably Jephthah's own brothers were also part of this delegation. When the Ammonites made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to bring Jephthah from the land of Tob, and they said to Jephthah, Come and be our commander, so that we may fight with the Ammonites. Remember that Israel in the time of the judges was a consortium of twelve tribes living in several regions of Canaan, among and actually in between the people groups who had already been living there. Mostly the Israelite tribes lived in the hill country. Their governance was localized, and their alliance was both loose and voluntary. There was no king, there was no central administration, but now there was war. And when under attack, typically elders of each village would begin the process of transferring the village over to the tribe in order to create a joint army. And what they offered, what all these elders offered Jephthah, could only come with the agreement of all the elders of his own village. For to be respected and followed as the commander of the armies, he would need standing in his own village. Giving Jephthah the position of commander would have reinstated his inheritance rights and returned his father's name to him. But Jephthah wanted more. Are you not the very ones who rejected me and drove me out of my father's house? So why do you come to me now when you're in trouble? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Nevertheless, we have now turned back to you, so that you may go with us and fight with the Ammonites and become head over us, over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight with the Ammonites, and the Lord gives them over to me, I will be your head. Notice that it's the illegitimate son of a prostitute and a highway robber who spoke first of God, rather than the respectable and legitimate village elders, chosen to lead and guide the people. This is one of the focal points of the story. Regardless of his ancestry or his occupation, Jephthah had put his faith in God, and he negotiated the position of chief of all Gilead even after the battle was won along with the commander of the armed forces, and his request was legitimate and reasonable, and the elders had the authority to grant this. Now, the elders, surely feeling the press of danger with Israel at war, and with the press of humiliation that they had not first called on God, hastily agreed. As commander-in-chief, Jephthah would oversee the taking of plunder and prisoners, unless they were put under the ban, which was called as God had commanded them through Moses. Here it is. Nothing that a person owns that has been devoted to destruction for the Lord, be it human or animal, or inherited land holding, may be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy to the Lord. You shall annihilate them, the Hittites and the Amorites, the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, just as the Lord your God has commanded. That word annihilate is harem in Hebrew, meaning devote to complete destruction. It was to be treated as a burnt sacrifice, translated from the earthly to the heavenly, that the smoke of it would rise from earth and into heaven for the Lord alone. Now, because the book of Joshua, which is the time that came right before the judges, used some form of the word harem nearly a hundred times, it's clear this authority granted only to the commander of the troops and head of the military effort, carried a great deal of spiritual power as well as impact on the people. Jephthah would also, along with this power over prisoners and plunder, cast the vision for the warriors to fight as auxiliaries of Yahweh, Almighty God, and that the victory that was to come belonged to the Lord. Here came his next bargain. He bargained with the Ammonites for settlement. Throughout the rest of the story, Jephthah comported himself in this classical sense of the chief, in keeping with the prevailing cultures. He'd already had a lot of practice leading his mercenary outlaws, and now he began a diplomatic mediation with the king of the Ammonites. The people of Jephthah's time believed that the land rights were bequeathed by the gods of the peoples and must be honored as granted. People were not seen as owning the land, but only leasing it from the gods. So Jephthah recounted Israel's history, their honorable dealings with surrounding nations and their legal right to the land they now occupied because it was through armed battle with Yahweh 
as victor. Jephthah invoked the ancient law that nations possess the land given to them by their gods, and he concluded, Should you not possess what your god Chemosh gives to you to possess? And should we not be the ones to possess everything that the Lord our God has conquered for on our behalf? But the king of the Ammonites did not heed the message that Jephthah sent him. Here came Jephthah's next bargain. He bargained with God for victory. Jephthah's diplomatic negotiations revealed strong faith in God, close knowledge of Israel's history, and a keen, logical mind. But it didn't work. And it was in this hour, as Jephthah marched with his army through the region of Gilead and through the region of Manasseh to meet the Ammonites in combat, that the Spirit of the Lord came upon Jephthah. Whatever comes next would be inspired by the Lord's Spirit, for this is God's anointing and empowering. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will give the Ammonites into my hand, then whatever comes out of the doors of my house to meet me when I return victorious from the Ammonites shall be the Lord's, to be offered up by me as a burnt offering. In a sense, Jephthah had made whatever would come out of his house, harem, as unto the Lord. As father of his household, Jephthah was permitted to make vows and oaths concerning everything in his care and under his authority. And what's more, as part of the ritual of holy war, it was permissible, even necessary, to be willing to sacrifice something much in compensation for the very great favor of being reinstated as father in his village and established as chief of Gilead and for victory if that was granted over the Ammonites. Jephthah thought he knew what he was saying, and he meant it. Animals were kept in the front part of the house, so he may have thought, let the Lord choose between my fatted calf and my yearling lamb. I will gladly give to God whatever the Lord asks in return for this victory. But remember, the Spirit of the Lord had inspired Jephthah's vow, and the Lord already had in mind whom God would move to greet Jephthah. And then came the battle. Once Jephthah's vow was made, the battle with the Ammonites was quickly dispensed with. Jephthah crossed over to the Ammonites to fight against them, and the Lord gave them into his hand. He inflicted a massive defeat on them from Arior to the neighborhood of Minith, twenty towns, and as far as Abel Karamim, so the Ammonites were subdued before the people of Israel. It should have been a moment of tremendous celebration, and it was. When Jephthah returned the conquering hero, there was a great celebration. Jephthah came to his home at Mizpah, and there was his daughter coming out to meet him with timbrels and with dancing. And she was his only child. He had no son or daughter except her. Actually, it was perfectly natural, even expected, that Jephthah's daughter would greet him first with timbrels and dancing. This was one of the offices of women to celebrate military victory. Think of Miriam in Exodus and her song of great victory. Think of Deborah and her song of military victory. And then think of the women celebrating David's victory. Saul killed his thousands and David his ten thousands. And as a virgin, Jephthah's daughter was his greatest asset, signifying the stability and productivity of his household. She was very probably more valuable to him than even a son, as he had to date no inheritance to bequeath to a son. And through his daughter, Jephthah would have had an opportunity, particularly now as chief of Gilead, to make a politically and economically strategic and advantageous alliance with a powerful family through giving her in marriage. And when he saw her, he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low. You have become the cause of great trouble to me, for I have opened my mouth to the Lord and I cannot take back my vow. You and I would expect Jephthah's daughter to blanch, to cry out in despair, for there to be agony and terror and horror, panic, frantical attempts at finding a way out of this disaster. But she did not. Instead, she insisted her father keep his vow and asked only that she be granted two months to mourn, not her death, but her virginity. 
She would never have the opportunity to exercise the power and authority granted to mothers, and never to receive the approval granted to mothers. And she said to him, My father, if you have opened your mouth to the Lord, do to me according to what has gone out of your mouth. Now that the Lord has given you vengeance against your enemies, the Ammonites. And she said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Grant me two months, so that I may go and wander on the mountains and bewail my virginity, my companions and I. Go, he said. And he sent her away for two months. So she departed, she and her companions, and bewailed her virginity on the mountains. At the end of two months, she returned to her father, who did with her according to the vow he had made. She had never slept with a man. Now, why would the text especially point out she had never slept with a man, which seems insignificant to the greater loss of her life? And why would she request time to mourn her virginity if she was going to die? Why would she not rather mourn her loss of life, which was by far the greater casualty. What really happened? Well, to figure that out, we have to go back to Jephthah's vow. He promised to give up to the Lord a sacrifice, and the word he used was ola, which could mean burnt sacrifice, but it could also mean ascent, often as in a stairway or steps. And Jephthah thought he meant he would give up to God something as a whole burnt offering, According to the Brown Driver Briggs lexicon, however, this meant that the sacrifice would be entirely consumed so as to go up in the flames of the altar to God, expressing the ascent of the soul in worship. And there's two kinds of ideas in that. Yet because he knew so much about Israel's history, and because the reading of the law was to happen three times a year at the all-tribe festival gatherings, so the Feast of Passover, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Booths, Jephthah must have known that God abhorred human sacrifice. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, you must not learn to imitate the abhorrent practices of those nations. No one shall be found among you who makes a son or daughter pass through the fire. For whoever does these things is abhorrent to the Lord. It is because of such abhorrent practices that the Lord your God is driving them out before you. That's just one of several passages that talk about it that way. And Jephthah must also have known that he could dedicate a person to the Lord, because such vows were mediated by the priests. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the people of Israel, and say to them, When a person makes an explicit vow to the Lord concerning the equivalent for a human being, they shall be brought before the priest, and the priest shall assess them, and the priest shall assess them according to what each one making a vow can afford. If these people were not redeemed with money, such persons would be brought directly to the tabernacle. It's with just exactly such a vow that Hannah would later dedicate her miraculous answer to prayer son Samuel to God, to be raised by the high priest Eli in the tabernacle. So we find out there arose an Israelite custom that for four days every year, the daughters of Israel would go out to lament the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite. And so from all of this, we can think that possibly Jephthah dedicated his daughter to the Lord in the same way that Hannah dedicated her son, that he was redeeming his daughter's life by forfeiting her future value to him. Possibly the women would go out to his daughter to mourn with her four days out of the year. Is it possible she became a servant to God in some other way, permanently lost to Jephthah for any earthly purpose, yet keeping her life because it had been abrogated completely to God, had been de dedicated as sacred to God. The Apostle Paul would describe this same kind of whole offering 15 centuries later. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercy of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And in all this, Jephthah's daughter also received a blessing. Now, the story of Jephthah's daughter is told from her father's point of view, but can we know something of her from this same story? Certainly we can see that she grew up in a God-fearing home with a father who loved her and valued her. And she was young, perhaps even as young as 12 or 13, because she was a virgin. 
and because her father was well known as a mighty warrior, even though she grew up with no place in the village, and her father, having been cast out, her household would have had no place in the village, still it was held in high regard by those who gave however begrudging admiration to her father's reputation. There would even have been marriage candidates among her father's highwaymen, just as there was for Bathsheba who married Uriah the Hittite, one of the mercenary soldiers among David's mighty men. It seems clear that Jephthah's daughter knew and reverenced God. She was spiritually attuned to God and she accepted with solemn grace the sacrifice of her life to God. The story also invites us to see God choosing her for this special dedication as the Spirit of the Lord had come upon Jephthah particularly and inspired his vow. Even though she would never have her own children, God gave her all the women in Gilead and perhaps the women from other parts of Israel to come to her each year. She would have no inheritance of her own, but as with the Levites, God gave her the Lord as her portion. She would have no household of her own, but it is possible, as with Samuel a few hundred years later, she eventually went to live in the tabernacle. Her grandma was a prostitute. Her father was illegitimate and a bandit when she was born. Yet God chose her and blessed her particularly. You know, it reminds me of another thing that Paul wrote. Consider your own call, brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards, and not many were powerful, and not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. Think of God's call on Anna the prophet a young and childless widow who spent most of her life in the temple, and on Mary of Magdala, became a disciple of Jesus and later an apostle to the apostles. Closer to our own time, think of the men and women who devoted their entire lives to the Lord and the Lord's work, countless monks and nuns and priests, the desert fathers and the desert mothers, missionaries like Amy Carmichael come to mind, and Audrey Wetherell Johnson. Think of God's call on your own life. You may have humble beginnings, and you may think you don't have anything special to bring to the table. Yet it is God's pleasure to choose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise, and choose what is weak in the world to shame the strong, and to choose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are because this is how God's glory shines through. Oh Lord God, thank you for the story of Jephthah's daughter. Thank you for taking to yourself those whom others might think are despised and small and not very important. And in the kingdom of God, in your kingdom, you make them as shining stars, ones to whom others can go for spiritual wisdom, for spiritual strength. For you've said that you'll bring down low, but you will also exalt in due time. And so we thank you to the praise and glory of your grace. Amen.